Andreas, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for hosting me, Rachel. So tell me, when it comes to global education, where does the U.S. stack up? Uh, the U.S. is an average performer. It used to be at the top of education league tables, but now it's sort of more in the middle of the pack. In mathematics, it's struggling. Uh, there are fairly large disparities in education. If you come from a wealthy home, you're actually doing fine. If you come from disadvantaged backgrounds, you see a quite significant performance drag, at least a lot more so than in many of the highest performing education systems. When it comes to COVID-19, how prepared was the U.S. for this pandemic compared to other nations? Well, I think this pandemic has uh, disrupted uh, education everywhere, and it has also disrupted sort of our model of education. If you think about it worldwide, we had 1.5 billion students affected by school closures. Uh, online learning, remote learning that used to be a nice and fancy extra has become sort of the lifeline for success in education and um, access, use and quality of online resources are amplifying educational inequality. That's also a pretty global phenomenon. I think few countries have exempted this from this. And then accreditation. You know, we no longer know how to recognize student learning when they are not on site. So I think it's the model approach. If you come again from a wealthy background, uh, you will be motivated to learn, you have acquired the right approach to learning, your parents to push you, you have access to technology. Maybe this is all liberating and exciting for young people, but if you come from a disadvantaged background, you do not have access to good online resources, no teacher you know, coaching you, uh, facilitating your work, no parents at home. And uh, most importantly, if you have been you know, spoon-fed by a teacher with little chunks of knowledge and suddenly you have to set your own learning goals to monitor your progress, to manage your own learning, these young people have a very, very hard time. That's a pretty global phenomenon. But now turning to the U.S., uh, uh, the, the U.S. is struggling. I think you can see that very clearly. Uh, in a way, the lack of an education system is sort of showing its weaknesses at this moment. Like uh, you contrast this with China, you know, within a month they had 50 million young people learning online and they had a teaching force that is not just, you know, instructing students in classrooms, but that is used to working to design innovative learning environments. That has been used to integrate technology into classroom practice. That has actually, where teachers have a lot of time to spend with students outside the classroom. and. All of these elements have been traditionally missing in the American uh, education systems. Teachers, uh, you know, have very little time to do other things than teaching compared with other nations. They have actually relatively limited exposure to technology and certainly to the integration of technology in pedagogy. So, yeah, that's very hard to recuperate in a very compressed kind of time. You know? Governor Qu Andrew Cuomo um, recently announced a partnership with the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. He wants to, to develop a blueprint to reimagine education through technology, some of these remote technologies that were working during the pandemic, um, especially when it comes to reaching um, students who have disabilities or are not proficient in English. Um, and I know that you've done a lot of research on the topic of equity in education and, and some of those challenges in the US. Do you think that sort of tech executives, they hold the key um, to, to closing some of those gaps in the U.S.? I do believe that technology can make a big difference. I mean, the irony is at the moment, technology is amplifying inequality in education, but technology also holds the potential to greater equity. Technology can make learning so much more granular, so much more interactive. Than you. Why you study on a technology platform, the platform will study you, identify, you know, where you have trouble, where you succeed, what is easy for you, what is boring for you. So technology can make learning so much more adaptive to the needs and learning styles of people that I do think it holds great potential, particularly when combined with learning analytics, you know, artificial intelligence. Uh, there are a lot of really good solutions, but, you know, technology can amplify great teaching, but it will not replace poor teaching. At the end of this is a matter of human capacities. Uh, you know, uh, with a technology solution, it's not that you need less good teachers. Teach, the role of teachers is simply changing. Teachers 
will be less instructors, but they need to be really great coaches, good mentors, good facilitators, good evaluators. So actually technology will further raise the demands on teachers. And that's why I see the really big bottlenecks. I think the technological solutions, uh, I think they will come relatively quickly. And this crisis has sort of given this agenda a big push, but the human capacity constraints are very real and very, very hard to address in the short term. If we could circle back to the human capacity aspect, a lot of teachers that I've spoken to, uh, they just, so much of their time try, is trying to just reach students and call them, especially if their students have special needs and need to have that personal interaction. Why is it that teachers in the US are stretched so thin compared to teachers in other, is it paperwork? What exactly is preventing them from having that time with their students? Well, I think it's also the work organization that is very different. Uh, American teachers, you know, have a pretty high teaching load by international standards, so they are not used to spend a lot of time with students outside the classroom as mentors, as coaches. They are not used to be designers of learning environments. They usually get fairly kind of prefabricated kind of lesson structures, and that's very different in many high-performing education systems. If you go to Japan, teachers would spend a lot of time with students out of the classroom, same in China or Singapore. If you are in Finland, teachers spend a lot of time with each other to design innovative learning environments. So for them, this crisis is just another instance of this. Whereas I think for teachers in the United States, it's a novel experience. But I think what this shows is that teaching and learning are not uh, transactional experiences. They're always relational experiences. So I do think actually uh, this moment where teachers connect with their students is one that I think that holds great potential for, for the future. I think that is where the potential of future teachers very much lies in this relational social component. It took schools a few weeks to really get a curriculum off the ground once the pandemic sort of shuttered all business in the state. Um, I was wondering, were there other nations that were more efficient. There, they had, you know, teachers had little guidance from the state. Um, there was little, few structures in place for them to adapt their um, class schoolwork to um, a remote learning model. Um, were, are there other nations that have figured it out or had something better in place that made it easier to get something off the ground? Well, there are some education systems where curriculum design and the development of learning environments is an integral part of the role of teachers. If you go to Belgium and the Netherlands, that's basically what teachers spend a fair amount of their time on. And of course, in a moment of crisis, you, the more professional autonomy you have and the greater the collaborative culture of teachers in schools, the easier it is to adapt. And that's, I think, one thing, I think a lesson I would take for the United States to strengthen teacher professional autonomy and also the kind of work organization that supports greater collaboration among teachers, among schools. So yeah, some countries had an easier time in this. Uh, some countries also have highly centralized approaches to curriculum development. Again, that can make things easier. Uh, but I think the big issue really is to what extent are teachers uh, used to work beyond the classroom on the design and adaptation of learning environments. I mean, what this crisis really means, if you as a teacher have been very, very good in giving lessons to students, you're out of business at this moment because there is a totally different model of learning that is now emerging. Uh, if you as a student have just, you know, been a consumer and participant, a passive participant, you are out of business. You're not going to manage your own learning environment. So I think it, this kind of crisis commands a fundamental shift in the way students learn, teachers teach, and schools operate. And uh, those systems that I have traditionally a lot of you know, flexibility at the front line have an advantage. And uh, you'll be surprised. You know, Many people say, well, the United States is the country of local autonomy. It's actually not so true when you talk about schools. If you look at the relative discretion that teachers and school leaders have over the, the content over the you know, running of the school, it's actually a lot more limited than what you find in some European countries uh, by comparison. In the past, when um, the Gates Foundation intervenes on uh, st a state education policy, there was this feeling that it was data-driven and it didn't incorporate enough teacher input or student input or parent input 
And it, sometimes when, you know, the state moves in that direction, it can feel a little top down and less inclusive and there's less teacher autonomy. How do you sort of balance that? Yeah, it's always a balance, you know. On the one hand, uh, you don't, uh, you wouldn't want to ask uh, doctors to invent their own medicines. You want to ensure that they can that can draw on and establish kind of methods. In a way, you would want that education is a little bit more of a science and maybe not less of an art, but certainly re relies more on a scientific methodology. And that I think has to be managed at a kind of more aggregate level. At the very same time, I think the flexibility and local responsiveness is also very, very important. Both for me are two sides of the same coin. So hindsight is twenty twenty. Now we're looking forward. You know, we all know about the summer slide. Uh, the COVID nineteen slide is arguably a lot steeper. Um, will students ever catch up? What would you recommend to school systems moving forward in terms of getting this generation of students that is going to be shaped by this? You know incredible like global epidemic um, how, how, how will schools get them up to speed? Well when uh, students and teachers will go back to school they will see a different world you know teachers will see a much more diverse kind of student population some students will require a lot more assistance and help to find their way back to schooling we regain trust in education regain trust in their teachers I think that's the uh, reality at the same time I also hope that you will see lots of students who say well you know actually i found online learning really interesting i discovered new ways of learning why can't we make learning in the school more adaptive more interactive more technology based i would expect to find many teachers who say well actually I've, i i did something else than just you know delivering similar lessons i actually you know learned how to different students learn differently and to how to embrace that diversity with differentiated pedagogical practice and I hope you know you're going to see schools to say well actually we can not just you know implement we can design innovative learning environments so I think you will see both things you will see a much more challenging context greater variability but I also believe that students teachers and schools are learning with and from this crisis and therefore that we will not return inevitably to the kind of status quo that uh, education came from Along with schools sort of moving in a more technologically forward direction, there is an opposite movement as well. Um, there's some parents and advocates and you know, um, civil rights groups are concerned about um, security aspect um, and just the increased reliance of technology in schools. Um, you know, on the one hand, they want, you know, technology can be a tool to help schools, but it can also put, uh, make student data vulnerable. And it's also, you know, for younger grades, I think, there, some educators are worried that it prevents kids from interacting with the world around them. Um, what is what is sort of the the common thinking about it nowadays? I think it's a question of balance. You know, technology-based learning doesn't mean that there's actually you no know, more visibly technological interaction in the classroom. Often, that technology in the modern world is entirely invisible. It's actually going to be about learning analytics, trying to understand how different students learn differently. But surely that raises the question, how do we balance uh, you know, the flow of information, you know, teachers understanding how different students learn and schools seeing the kind of picture areas, privacy and individual rights to data. I do think that's a trade-off, but we are making the trade-off every day in our lives. The school is really no different. I think what we have done in the past is, you know, we have in a private life, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, everybody can do anything. And then you enter the school, you have to switch off everything because we don't know how to manage this. I do think that is a challenge that schools are, will face. How do we balance the, uh, the data related rights of people with the need for learning to become more granular and to help, you know, different students learn differently? How can technology sort of be harnessed to sort of meet students where they're at? And how have other nations done that? I do think that technology holds very significant potential to make learning more relevant and more equitable because technology is very, very good in adapting uh, to our individual preferences and learning styles. You know, when you solve a mathematics problem, the mathematics problem can study you, find out exactly, you know, where you struggle, where you're different. You can vary the font size, you can vary the presentation of tasks. There's a lot you can do with technology to adapt to the learner, you can vary the pace, you can make learning uh, truly adaptive to preferences and learning styles. That's the 
potential if it's deployed really well. And that's, I think, something that we lack with the kind of one size fits all approaches that often dominate in our traditional school systems. But again, you know, don't underestimate the demands it puts on teachers. Uh, you really need extraordinary teachers to deploy technology uh, uh, well. And that's what we see around the world where you have an amazing teaching force. Technology is just, you know, accelerating that progress, making, you know, the best teaching practice is universally available and having, you know, every student benefit from excellent teaching. But where teachers struggle with technology, it can be a destruction. You know, let's face it, technology can make learning more superficial. It can make learning more prescriptive. You can almost get the opposite of what we are talking about with technology badly deployed. You know, when students just, you know, type on a tablet or a computer, that's not, you know, deep learning. That's basically very superficial acquisition of content. And I think that's a great risk as well. It's really about having very, very good designers behind this and making the teaching profession part of the design of those solutions. This is not something just for tech companies. This is something where you really, the education profession really needs to be at the heart of the design and development and implementation of those solutions. Moving forward, what can the US do to prepare for a similar crisis in the future? I think countries can do work on a lot of fronts. Uh, the first thing is really to design and develop innovative technological solutions and to create shared platforms. You know, we have a lot of localized solutions in school districts and individual schools, but actually different from the tech sector elsewhere. They don't have much kind of shared solutions that are open that are accessible. I think that's the quick win. That's something I do think will not take a lot of time, not even a lot of money. Uh, the harder part is to give uh, uh, schools and teachers uh, greater discretion uh, to actually become, you know, the innovators, the game changers in, in, in this. And uh, the hardest part is to invest in professional capacity. I do think the United States has done a lot to make teaching, you know, financially a bit more attractive, but it can do a lot, lot more to make teaching intellectually more attractive. That means, you know, giving teachers, uh, involving teachers more in the in, uh, in advancing the profession and giving them better opportunities to learn from and with other teachers, giving them better resources to work. And I think uh, it's this work organization and environment that will ultimately determine how attractive is teaching going to be in the United States. And that will shape, you know, whom are you going to get? And only if you get the very best people will you actually deploy the most innovative educational solutions. Thank you so much for joining me, Andreas. Thank you very much.